establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Rise with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Rise. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yeah. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten tonight as Scots rejoice at their independence from scheming Sturgeon. Can the country be united once again by togetherness and hope instead of Queen Nick's trademark division? I'll explain why the Sturgeon era is now unravelling and how she has done untold damage to Scotland and ironically her separatism cause. That's in my digest. Next, there, my superstar panel give their view. Joining me tonight, Sarah Vine, Sean Bailey and ex-SNP councillor Austin Sheridan. Then ex-Tory minister Anne Whittakam weighs in on the SNP figurehead's catastrophic economic legacy, Big Witty style, at 9.50. And as Sturgeon's most famous critic, J.K. Rowling, speaks out in a landmark podcast... I never set out to upset anyone. However, I was not uncomfortable with getting off my pedestal. So is the hunting and cancellation of the Harry Potter author a modern-day witch trial? And despite it all, did she end up emerging victorious over the Scottish First Minister? The Free Speech Union founder Toby Young explores at 10.20. After Nicola Bully's family hit out and the Lancashire police face accusations of victim blaming, was the force wrong to reveal details about the missing mother's issues with alcohol and the menopause? We're going to debate the crisis of confidence and competence facing the cops behind the missing person investigation that has captivated the country. As the MSM continue to demonise ordinary Brits for telling the government is enough is enough on immigration, does protesting against illegal migrants make you racist and far right? Well, Tory MP for Barry Morth, James Daly, former Brexit Party MEP Rupert Lowe, and human rights lawyer Shoab Khan go head to head on that in the clash at 9.20. Plus, does the crass stigmatisation of working class people as far right, despite their concerns, in my view, being genuine and legitimate, put lives at risk? Galvin McKenzie gives his unfiltered take at 10.40. Also coming up on the show tonight, as Meghan Markle is slammed in court for subjecting her estranged sister to ridicule, contempt and disgrace, is the Sussex's web of lies finally coming back to haunt them? My royal masterminds, Sadie Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier, analyse that with new information too at 9.35. And it's not just an American court where Harry and Meghan are getting a right royal pasting. Our Instagram-loving wife actually doesn't want her privacy. How dare! 
tell you, sir, my Instagram loving <laughs> wife has always wanted her privacy. <laughs> so are the toxic couple now an even bigger laughing stock stateside than in the UK? Stay tuned to see the rest of that fascinating South Park clip as we examine the Montecito Mona's humiliating fall from grace. That's in the media buzz. We'll have a first look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you too. Plus, a brand new Union Jackass and Greatest Britain revealed the last of the week. This is Dan Wooten tonight. Let's go. Good evening to you, my digest. Coming up on the untold damage scheming Sturgeon has done to Scotland and her separatist cause. But first, the news headlines at nine with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Good evening to you. The Prime Minister has tonight arrived in Northern Ireland amid speculation that a deal could be close over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Rishi Sunak has made the journey with the Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Seaton-Harris, to hold talks with all political parties there. The UK and the EU have been in intense talks to secure improvements to the post-Brexit trade deal. Well, now expectations are growing that new terms could be set out in the next few days, and you'll hear that first on GB News. Now, Sir Keir Starmer has made a surprise visit to Ukraine to meet with President Zelensky. The Labour leader pledged that support for Kyiv will continue if his party comes to power. Sakir also visited the cities of Bukha and Irpin, where he was shown evidence of alleged atrocities committed by Russian troops. During the trip, he called for Russia to face justice in The Hague. Throughout the conflict, the Labour Party has stood united with the government in the United Kingdom um, to show our support for Ukraine. And we will have an election next year, um, and there may well be a change of government. But should there be a change of government next year in a general election, there will be no change in the position of support for Ukraine, both during the conflict and in the cause for justice. Lancashire Police has reserved... I'm sorry, referred itself to the police watchdog over contact they had with Nicola Bully and her husband, Paul Ansell, prior to her disappearance. The force says it was called to Nicola's home on January the 10th, 17 days before she went missing. It comes after yesterday detectives unexpectedly revealed that the 45-year-old was vulnerable and she'd struggled with alcohol and the menopause. Earlier, Miss Bully's family said the public focus was now more about appalling speculation into her private life than actually finding her. Scotland's health secretary is reportedly expected to enter the race to become the next leader of the Scottish National Party. The Daily Record says Humza Yousaf will throw his hat into the ring after Nicola Sturgeon stepped down as First Minister. The SNP's executive committee says it's postponing its special conference with the ballot to select Sturgeon's successor closing on the 27th of March. Other possible replacements include Deputy First Minister John Swinney and Finance Secretary Kate Forbes. Now, in the last hour, we've received uh, some news from America that it's been announced that the actor Bruce Willis has been diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia, the most common form of the condition found in people under the age of 60 years old. And a warning, the following footage does contain some flashing images. Last spring, the actor announced his retirement after being diagnosed with aphasia, which affects his cognitive abilities, and now his family has said... That condition has progressed. Describing the news as painful, they say they hope the media attention will shine a light on the disease. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Back now to Dan Wooden tonight. So maybe just maybe the anti-English rhetoric that became so prevalent during the divisive and vicious reign of scheming Sturgeon might just be coming to an end. Last night on the streets of Glasgow, unionists came together to celebrate a truly seismic shift in Scottish politics. <laughs> But 
But it's not just a change in tone in Scotland that will emerge in the post-Sturgeon era, but potentially a massive change in policy too. The extremists in the room, like uh, the fox-bashing barrister Joylan Morn, might be upping the rhetoric to dangerous levels. I mean, today he tweeted, I will be very sad to see Nicola Sturgeon's departure, but Westminster has made it very hard to see a peaceful way forward, despite uh, forward for the aspirations of many Scottish people for self-determination or even proper devolved government. Very hard to see a peaceful way forward? Wow. What's the alternative, sir? But look, sensible Scots know such talk is foolish. SNP chiefs have announced in the last few moments that they have postponed their special conference to choose Sturgeon's successor. So this was the conference that was set to rubber stamp Queen Nick's deranged bid to turn the next general election into a referendum on separation, even as the country's health and education system were plunged into deeper crisis by the day. The party's Westminster leader, Stephen Flynn, made it clear this morning that Sturgeon may remain in post for now, but her agenda is quickly being torn up. That to referendum was obviously put forward by the by the First Minister, and we were going to be discussing and debating the merits of that at that party conference. I, I personally think that that party conference should be paused for obvious reasons. I think the new leader should have the the opportunity and indeed the space to set out their position, their values and their intentions going forward. Most significant is the likelihood that some of Sturgeon's woke extremism, including the sick gender recognition reform bill, might follow her out the door. The Daily Telegraph reported today that sources in Holyrood have suggested a proposed legal challenge to the Westminster veto of the law. A law, by the way, let's never forget, uh, would allow rapists and child abusers to self-ID before they face trial for their crimes. Uh, the newspaper says that law will now be quietly dropped as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Sturgeon's SNP CEO husband, Peter Morrell, is facing increasing pressure to quit too, as negative headlines swirl around a police investigation into an alleged missing £600,000 in donations, a topic Sturgeon refused to comment on during her press conference yesterday. What is it that's changed over the last few weeks? You've mentioned some things. The only thing you didn't mention is the police inquiry into the party's finances. It's like... These things are not uh, the reason I'm standing here today. Uh, these are not factors, nor will my decision today affect these things, uh, and all of these things will, will take their course. What's clear is that the Sturgeon era is now unravelling. She has done untold damage to Scotland and, ironically, her separatist cause. But to respond now, my superstar panel, top Daily Mail columnist Sarah Vine, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and the former SNP councillor Austin Sheridan. So Sarah Vine, I mean, she's not even out the door and already... The power the big is... proposal, yeah. they're going. Yeah, it's all, it's, all, it's all falling away. I mean, you can see, I mean, she's had a terrible sort of combination of, of factors. I mean, the, 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 the whole... The self-identification bill was very badly judged by her. I don't think she had any idea that it would meet with such cogent opposition, actually, because the opposition to it, to it has been very sort of sensible and measured. It hasn't been hysterical or anything like that. It hasn't been sort of anti-trans feeling. It's just been, you know, quite a lot of sensible people saying, this is not a good idea, this will end up... You know, and, and we saw the example of, of the guy who... Adam Graham. Exactly. Yeah. So that was bad. I think, I think the independent stuff, you know, she had a real setback with that in the Supreme Court. That was a real problem for her. And I just think, you know, if you can't, if you can't command the, the, the sort of... If you can't command the respect of the party, you can't lead. It's, it's, it's the same for any politician. It doesn't matter where they are. And they have to have the confidence. Of course. And, of course, the police investigation. I don't really understand what's going on there. It all seems very murky to me, but it seems odd that, you know, he should have given the SNP... Lent, he lent them 100,000 mm. or more, didn't he? And, and then, she would not even no. talk about no, it. No, no. She kept referring. So, she kept referring to short-term issues, which I thought was rather insulting to all those women who suddenly found themselves in a prison with a male rapist yeah. to be described as a short-term issue. Very true. But you know, very true. I mean, Sean Bailey, look, uh, the SNP will be about political survival now, and 
they know, I think, to survive politically, they have to move away from some of these extremist policies that Sturgeon has been pushing. Not just the gender recognition reform bill, but also turning the next general election into a de facto referendum on separatism, when actually there are far more important pressing issues at home in Scotland. The long answer to that is yes, and so is the short answer, because <laughs> if the party didn't feel that way, she would still be the leader right now. She's gone from a superstar to nowhere in a short, mm. very short period of time. And what you're seeing now is not only a party that have changed leader, they're trying to run away from her. And I think they've just seen the writing on the wall. If you're here in Britain, it sounds like... So if you're down here in England, it sounds like every Scot wants to be independent of, of England. It now seems that might not be quite the case and she made herself Far such a the case exactly and she made herself such a symbol of independence if you run the SNP you if you feel like independence is not the way to go you have to get her gone because while she's there it's all about independence and without her you can have a different story and of course Scotland is suffering the NHS in Scotland's in a mess education's in a mess Nicola Sturgeon's personal rating is in a mess and if you run that party if you want the SNP to be able to fight the Tories and Labour at the next election you cannot do that behind Nicola Sturgeon, that's why she's gone. I mean, Pop, she's just gone just like that. Austin Sheridan, our favourite pro-Sturgeon SNP defender, you've valiantly been behind the First Minister for months and months. Uh, sitting here tonight for the first time on the Superstar panel, do you still stand by Sturgeon or are you like other folk in the SNP who are very quickly running away from the dangerous path she was taking your party down? No, I mean, I stand by Sturgeon. I stand by the idea behind the uh, gender recognition reform. Really? Even I mean, now? I, I, understand, I understand the merits of it. However, I think potentially to jump into talking about court action immediately, you know, without negotiating with the UK government, um, you know, speaking to the Secretary of State for Scotland would be a sensible way forward to find out what the concerns are and how we can maybe be, you know, um, take away the block from the legislation. However, so you're prepared to ha see that bill watered down uh, because got, Sturgeon wasn't. Well, well what I'm prepared. She to... actually voted for the amendment, which okay. meant that even child sex abusers and rapists uh, would have to refer to the accused, uh, their accused abuser in court by their new pronoun. Well, what what I'm prepared to do. And what I would like to see happen is for the Secretary of State for Scotland to actually point out, first of all, what parts of the Equality Act that this legislation isn't, isn't impinging upon, because the UK government... But this is political today, suicide for no, your party, but what they're Do you not understand no, that? because what they're talking about, the reason they blocked it, they said it impinged on the Equality Act. So what I would like to do, first of all, would be to sit down with the UK government and find out exactly... Are you not listening to your that, people, that, that impinges. No, of course we're listening to people. And the thing they is, this isn't it. just Nicola Sturgeon. Every, this got support from every single mm. political party in the Scottish Parliament, including Conservative mm. members. What, just so it's, it's not just an SNP okay. thing. OK, one other question about leadership, Austin. What... Why did Sturgeon not groom a successor? I mean, whatever you think of Alex Salmond, he was very good at knowing when it was time to leave the stage, but also knowing how important it was to have someone to take the reins. Uh, no offence, but there's no superstars waiting there in your party, is there? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I would agree with our pants on was... I think a big challenge for Nicholas Sturgeon was the way forward for independence and how the SNP were going to deliver that. For me personally, um, I, I, um, I was not keen on the idea of using a Westminster election as a de facto okay. referendum. So that's gone. Right. You agree that's gone? Too, too many issues being, yep. being, being, yeah. being muddled up. In terms of, of successors, the, uh, the SNP has a wide range of talent. I mean, if we can name three off the top, I've got... Angus Robertson, who could be a fantastic successor. Oh, We've got Kate Forbes. Um, you know, we have John Swinney. There's a wide pool of talent. Yeah, but the problem is, the you SNP. don't want but Kate, Dan, though, do you? Because you're you're on the you're on the extreme yeah. woke side of the party. Do, do you want this fundamentalist I, Christian I'm who on, doesn't believe in gay marriage to I, lead your party? I'm on the progressive side of the party, um, and what <laughs> I believe sure. is that SNP members um, will make the right choice okay. when it comes. Okay, to Okay, sure, you want to come but, in? Look. look. Nicola Sturgeon never groomed a successor because she never planned to leave. Yep. Yeah. I use the word pop because it exploded in her face. Even last month? She, 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 she had no plan to leave. And the other reason she didn't groom a successor, because if you groom that successor too early, they become your executioner. Mm -hmm. She dominated uh, Scottish politics, and that meant she got all the plaudits, but what she didn't realise is she'd also have to carry all the pain. That's why she's had but to Sarah, go. For every it's very irresponsible of her. Well, it was. Well, yeah. It was. But for every politician, though... It's terrifying how quickly things can change. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Because, look, here's Austin. A minute is a very long time. Absolutely. And, Austin, look, all credit to you. You have always been a staunch Sturgeon defender. But even tonight, Austin saying, look, she was wrong yeah. on, on the de facto 
referendum. Yeah, and, and once it goes, it's almost impossible to, to yeah. avoid it. Yeah. You absolutely just can't. You can't the push The power back. just drains. Yeah, it just, it just drains away. And that's why, you know, she's there now, but the, that can't no. last. I mean, do, they... do you know the one thing that I wish, though? Just imagine if the Scottish media, who were so pro-sturgeon for so many years, imagine if they'd put the same sort of pressure on her as they did mm. do very well, mm. by the way, over the past few mm. weeks, mm. about Scotland's domestic issues, mm. you know, about yeah. the drug kids, about yeah. the failed NHS. Yeah. They let her get away with so much so for much. so long. But she was, but she, but she, I mean, she was a very skillful yeah, politician. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, just, you know, I remember writing a column Great. about her years ago saying, you know, I don't agree with anything she says, but I really respect mm. her as an operator because she really was very good at what she did. And also, I'm going to be cruel now, just finally, because I've given you 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you come up with a success yet? Because you remember I asked you last night, what, what are her successes? Have you, have you come up with one yet, a domestic yeah, I, I mean, a domestic success was how she led us through the pandemic. And, and one of the things that our opponents, right, said during that time was she was so authoritarian, uh, you know, oh, uh, um, was, that yeah. people don't like what she's doing yet. Um, in 2021, when we had the Scottish parliamentary election, during the pandemic, she got 47.7% okay. nope, of votes. No, she was successful in that election. I'll give you that. Votes. OK, Austin so the, Sheridan, the public Sean Bailey, Sarah Vine. I would say uh, she used the COVID pandemic, a health pandemic, for uh, revolting political purposes anyway. But just my view. Uh, my superstar panel with me all night. But coming up, as Megan is blasted in court for subjecting her estranged sister to ridicule, contempt and disgrace, is the Sussex campaign to trash both their families coming back to bite them? Well, my royal mouse friends, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier, have new information on that. They're going to reveal it at 9.35. But up next, in the clash, as Brits who have had enough of the country's out-of-control immigration are demonised by the MSM, does protesting against illegal Legal migrants make you racist and far right somehow. Well, Tory MP for Berry North, James Daly, former Brexit Party MEP Rupert Lowe, and human rights lawyer Shoab Khan are going to go head to head on this next. What do you think? Dan at GBNews.uk. Vote in our poll. The results straight after the break. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, that's my you, ringtone. You, no. My political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes now. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. 
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, <laughs> right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Time now for The Clash. More than 2,000 mostly adult male undocumented migrants have entered Britain illegally on small boats this year already. And Brits have had enough. They've had enough of not knowing who's been set loose in their community. They've had enough of feeling unsafe. They've had enough of being ignored. But where anyone dares to speak out, like the worried mothers, fathers and grandparents in Knowsley, they are unfairly branded far right and racist, despite their concerns about uncontrollable immigration being totally legitimate. What do you think? Does protesting against illegal migrants make you racist and far right? Dan at GBNews.uk, vote in our poll at GB News. It's taking off right now. But to help me make up your mind, I'm joined by the former Brexit Party MEP Rupert Lowe, human rights lawyer Shoab Khan. And James Daly, the Conservative MP for Bury North. And James, let me start with you, because I imagine you're hearing from your constituents a lot about this issue. And I don't think if they're expressing a concern, it, it means they're on the far right. Do you? Well, good evening, Dan, and, and thank you very much for having me on. I'm delighted to be on, but I can't actually believe this is a serious question. Um, if I choose, before I became MP for Bury North in 2019, I was a councillor in Bury for 10 years. Um, I campaigned and knocked on thousands of doors throughout the country, but mainly in the north of England. By a million miles, Dan, the, mo the, the, the most important concern and the major issue that was raised with me throughout the country was issues and concerns regarding immigration. The great fault of the left has always been, and those who... You know, those who look back on Brexit may want to take some notice of this, in that those concerns that the people in Knowsley have had have been there for a long, long time. And the tactic of the left, just to brand everybody racist because they have legitimate concerns about their community and the sustainability of their community, is absolute madness. And it's time, you know, that politicians like me stood up and called this stuff out. It's like it's the left-wing thought police wanting to impose their morality upon other people who are living lawful, peaceful lives and they're being let down by politicians. So it quite clearly is nothing to do, it is like any other issue, that people have got the right to legitimately protest and question their politicians about some of the very, very bad decisions that are happening at the moment regarding immigration. Well, I couldn't agree more, and, and I think it's shocking that we are having to have this conversation. But Rupert Lowe, uh, you tweeted about this earlier uh, earlier in the week because actually that is how the protesters are being branded by much of uh, the liberal establishment. Well, as we know, Dan, the, the most of the liberal establishment are completely woke. I mean, to call somebody racist for just standing up for their own country and what they believe in is is poppycock. Uh, and at the end of the day, look, I'm, I'm all in favor of legal uh, targeted immigration. You know, the Australians do it extremely well. They have a points system. They don't tolerate any illegal immigration. If you, if you cut, try and come in illegally, they, they ban you from coming to Australia ever again. Uh, these guys, as you say, are young men. They're from Albania. They're from, from parts of the world which they're not really uh, what I'd call economic migrants. They're just coming here because we, we tolerate them. Uh, as we know, QE has allowed the state to grow like a weed, and most of the state is failing, including the Home Office. So, I, you know, if there was a will to stop them coming in, uh, we could easily do it. And certainly looking at my, my previous uh, constituency in the West Midlands, we were filling up uh, private hotels with 
illegal immigrants, again, by stealth, uh, a bit like we tax people now by stealth. Everything is done by the liberal establishment through stealth. Oh, and and I, I, th I think decent people have every right to stand up mm. if the state is faking and call them out. Yep. So I have absolutely okay. no problem. And well, I, well, well let's get the other side me. of the argument on this, because Shoab Khan, uh, I believe that you say that many of the protesters in Nosley were far right. Um, I don't know if necessarily many, um, but obviously there was definitely um, a far right presence there um, and has has become clear over the past few days. Um, it seems to have been instigated by, encouraged by, possibly organized by um, far right groups. Um, and so there, there was a particularly particular group, I won't name it, um, but which seems to be the fastest growing is being said far right group, which was actually leafleting homes, local homes in the locality just in the previous week before that. Um, and then obviously what we saw, I mean, I know we, we're talking about, you know, I'm a human rights lawyer, I'm all for the right to protest, but peaceful protest, protest that does not antagonize others, protest that is not hostile, protest that is not destructive. Um, yep. Obviously, hammering... Indeed, and, and we all want that. Setting but, but, it on fire. But Shoab, can I just ask something and you can respond? Do you also concede that there were uh, nefarious far-left elements at the protest? I mean... The Communist Party actually issued on Twitter a call out for anti fascists to come. Uh, and there's strong speculation that many of the hooded violent folk there were actually members of Antifa. So, but no one's um, talking I about that. Say, I, I can't say I've seen any credible report that that was the case. I mean, obviously, we've heard. Well, we've well heard the there's the tweet. We've heard there's from the tweet. There. We've heard from the police there. Okay, but um, there's the tweet. Obviously, what, what we are saying is that whoever it was who was actually, um, you know, who set the police van on fire, who was attacking, who was throwing fireworks at police officers, obviously that is wrong. And I know, I mean, obviously, we spoke about and we've heard about, you know, people r raising their concerns and the government failing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I doubt there's anyone more critical mm. than me of the government and its failings. Of course, yep. the government, you know. Okay, it's been J James Daly James... said the Home Office was not unfit for purpose. So, of James... course, that's all there. Of but course. the point no, is, how I do hear... you put your point across? Okay, I hear you. J James Daly, look, the issue that I have is that actually we don't know who was behind that violence. I'm sure all of us condemn violence on, in the strongest possible of terms. But I've, I've just shown evidence, James Daly, that actually the hard left were also organising. Dan, it's not... Again, Dan, I, I'm enjoying being part of the, of the panel, but it's an utterly ridiculous conversation that if people commit offences, they're criminals, and the police arrest them, no matter whether they're yeah. left, right, whoever they are. It's as simple and as straightforward as that. And we have the, the laws in place... Um, to do that. So, you know, th this idea that the left can impose upon titles upon people for protesting that they don't like. Perhaps they could be, you know, as vociferous about this when people are sat in the middle of the M6, you know, stopping people getting cancer treatment and various other things. You know, when people are causing mm. damage to national monuments, when they're throwing, you know, causing criminal damage and throwing monuments into, into rivers. Oh, yeah, they, they don't see, care about that. They about stand by and watch. Dan, it's all about imposing their morality on a set of circumstances. Mm. So it's not about the underlying issues of why local people in Nosley are bothered. What they want to do is, is, is broaden the political issue to suit their own needs. I've just been reading in The Guardian that one of the groups who've been condemning this are Care for Calais. Now, Dan, if we had about two hours, I could tell you something about Care for Calais because I've been with them in, you know, three weeks ago. I was uh, on the beaches of Calais with you know, with Care for Calais, an organisation that the French authorities say essentially they view as enemies, that they say are hindering any uh, actions yes. by the French government to meaningfully address um, the, the flow of uh, migrants coming across, you know, going, coming across to this country. So we've also got a lot of organisations who hide behind Hocus Pocus who are enabling what I consider to be illegal immigration, but they're masquerade as the kings and queens of liberalness, you know, to call the rest of us, you know, all, all these names. It's, it's utterly ludicrous. If people commit yep. criminal offences, arrest them. End of story. Indeed. Cho Ab, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, obviously, um, Dan's, I mean, the, the Tories, they've been in power for um, more than a decade. We have absolutely no solutions. The problem is getting worse. I mean, I doubt any of us wants to see the hotels full. I mean, from the asylum seekers' point of view, from the home office, the public's point of view, the point is what's being done. Um, th things are just getting Well, I think worse that's something we can all agree on. Not enough, right, Rupert? Not enough has been done. Uh, not, 
not enough's been done, any. Dan. And in the end, as, as usual, it's the honest, decent middle class and, and, and yep. sort of enterprising taxpayer who's picking out the tab and having just sent a very large sum indeed. of money to the tax. Yeah, indeed. Today. And, and by the way, seven times more of these illegal migrants are being sent to red wall seats compared to the South East. And we should never forget that either. But look, a fascinating debate. Thank you all for having it. I agree we shouldn't have to have it, but that's where we're at at the moment. Former Brexit Party MEP Rupert Lowe, the human rights lawyer Shoab Khan and James Daly, the Conservative MP for Bury North. But who do you agree with on this? Does protesting against illegal migrants make you racist and far right? Spicer on Twitter says, no, it's not racist. Protesting means you have a genuine concern about the future society of our children and what they will grow up in. From Anthea, yes, it is far right and racist. These people are just human beings. And from Cameron, most people who throw around terms like far right wouldn't even be able to define those things other than whatever I don't agree with. And your verdict is now in. Just 11% of you say that protesting against legal migrants is racist and far right. 89% of you say it is not. Now, coming up, as a think tank slams Sturgeon's disastrous economic legacy after a decade of punishing taxes and financial uncertainty, has her separatist obsession left Scots poorer? Ex-Tory Minister Anne Widdicombe examines the smouldering ashes of the failed First Minister's reign at 9.50. But first, as Meghan is slammed in court for subjecting her estranged sister to ridicule and contempt, is the Sussexes plan to ruin both their families coming back to haunt them? Well, my royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier, they have new information on this. They're going to reveal all straight after the break. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now, and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel, and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Rise with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. Do you have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already to bless. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6am. 
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Time now for our brilliant royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier. And who would have thought trashing your family in public would go without consequence? Meghan Markle back in court, this time defending a defamation case from her half-sister and friend of this show, Samantha Markle. Now, Sam, a good woman, an honest woman, is accusing the runaway Duchess of trashing her reputation after being slammed as a, quote, disgusting opportunist in the infamous Oprah Winfrey interview for March 2021. It's claimed Meghan also suggested Sam cashed in on her relationship with Prince Harry and the royal told false and malicious lies about her rags to riches royal fairy tale at the expense of her estranged family. Now, Pete, Sam's lawyer, uh, Peter Tickton, told court that Meghan's comments had killed Sam's career. He said words are defamatory when they tend to subject one to hatred, distrust, ridicule, contempt or disgrace or tend to endure one in one's business or profession. In this case, we've got it all. Meanwhile, Meghan's lawyer is attempting to get the case thrown out with her brief, Michael Kump, telling the judge, calling someone an opportunist is not defamatory, opinions are not and cannot be defamatory. There's no way to determine if that's true or false. Well, I hope that's how Meghan feels next time she's trying to sue a UK newspaper, which she seems to do at regular interviews. But look, Lady C, this is a fascinating case. Uh, you're obviously in the know more than anyone. Do you think the Sussexes' web of lies are finally coming back to haunt them? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, the reality is there is a possibility that this case might be disallowed and it will be dismissed without prejudice, which would mean that Samantha will have the opportunity to re-issue proceedings, which she will do if she has to. But the reality is whether Samantha wins or loses in court, Meghan has lost in the court of public opinion. Everybody now knows Meghan is a vicious liar, a very manipulative, nasty human being who has no compunction about destroying her beloved, her loving father and her disabled sister. And there is absolutely no way, in my opinion, that Meghan will ever be able to recover from the revelations that Samantha's lawsuit have exposed her as having possessed. No, very strong words, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, Phil Dampier, can we just talk for a moment about Meghan's defence, her lawyer's defence? I mean, is she the biggest hypocrite in the world? And I genuinely mean that, because this is a woman who literally reads an opinion column she doesn't like and is on the phone to her lawyer, Shilling, saying, sue them! Sue them now. You know, she sued uh, the Mail on Sunday for publishing a letter that she wrote to Thomas Markle, even though she wrote the letter with the full knowledge that it was probably going to be leaked. And by the way, her friends had already leaked the contents of the letter to People magazine. And all of a sudden now, she's saying, oh, no, words and opinions aren't defamatory. Yeah, good evening. I mean, I couldn't stop laughing this morning when I read what uh, the lawyer, you showed a picture of him there, Michael Kump. We might yeah. call him Michael yeah. Kump, Kump the Chump. He told the judge, <laughs> apparently, in, he told the judge in Florida that, quote, not every perceived slight should be litigated. I mean, talk about pot and kettle. I mean, what have they done for the last two years? Every single time they've uh, had a perceived slight, they've gone running to their lawyers. And yet, as I said last week, they like dishing it out, but they don't like taking it. it it's absolutely extraordinary. And he went on to say that Meghan's feelings that she grew up as an only child was simply an expression of her subjective feelings today. So it's a bit like Harry's book, really spare. Recollections may vary, as the Queen said.
Well, indeed. I I indeed. I mean, Lady C, I think what's really important to point out as well is that this isn't about the money for Sam Markle. I mean, she could have sued for far, far more than $75,000. This is about actually protecting the reputation of a good family, uh, the Markle family, who have had their name dragged through the mud for many, many years. Yes, of course. I mean, the reality is Samantha has done what her father couldn't do because he couldn't afford to sue people. Uh, and he should he should really have sued people. But, you know, he couldn't and also the timing wasn't right. I mean, the timing with this is not ideal. But this is not about money. This is about justice. This is about honour. This is about integrity. This is about stopping a vicious liar from traducing the reputation of decent, innocent people. This is what it's about. This is a real David and Goliath case, a fight for justice and decency to prevail over the vicious, vicious lies and the hypocrisy of really the most unconscionable public figure that we have, and brazen public figure mm. that we have seen for many a decade. I mean, the woman is beyond belief. And as we saw from uh, the South Park episode that I played a little smidgen of at the top of the show, America is turning to, and do stay tuned in the next hour because I'm going to show you this episode which completely rips Harry and Meghan to shreds. It's just extraordinary. But look, I also want to talk, uh, Lady C, about this bombshell post unearthed from Meghan's old blog, The Tig that reveals she knew all about the royals two years before she met Harry, which seems to blow apart these claims that she had never even Googled them. So in 2014, Meghan wrote that she dreamed of being a, quote, royal rebel and not a traditional princess, all while commenting on William and Kate's wedding. So is this another proven Meghan Markle uh, falsehood, shall we say, to add to the pile? Well, you know, I said in my book, Meghan and Harry, The Real Story, that Meghan had studied the royals and that not only did she say, did she indicate that in the TIG, but in her previous blog, The Working Girl or Working Actress, it was a working something, not quite sure, but we all know what she was really working, which was her talents. And the reality is, that, you know, Meghan studied them. I was told that Meghan has religiously used my book, The Real Diana, as a template to be able to seduce Harry and evoke Diana's memory and pretend to be Diana Mach too. I was told this by somebody who knows Megan very well, and who Megan said that this is what she had done. So whether that's fair or not, that's what I was yeah. told. And certainly the okay. parallels between what her behavior and what she, and and my book are beyond coincidental. I mean, Phil, we obviously have to put on the record that there is no evidence uh, that that Megan studied the royals. However, some of Harry's claims now are looking a little bit far-fetched, aren't they? I mean, he really genuinely believed that, that Meghan had no idea about the Queen, I'll the say, Danny, Queen, I'll about I'll say Lady C's, in, Lady C's in cracking form tonight, isn't she? She, <laughs> she really is letting rip. Fantastic stuff. No, I don't think anyone ever believed that she didn't know anything about the royal family or never heard of Prince Harry. I mean, this is a woman who'd uh, worked at the US Embassy in, in uh, Buenos Aires. She'd addressed the United Nations. She was a highly intelligent woman. Uh, she'd uh, been on holiday and posed upside, outside Buckingham Palace when she was 15. The idea that she didn't know anything about the royal family or, or never heard of Prince Harry was absolutely ridiculous. And this, this latest thing shows that not only did she know about them, but she was already getting, forming an opinion about it. She wanted to be a rebel and didn't like Kate, you know, sort of thought that the, uh, the, the hullabaloo around Kate's wedding was over the top. So she was already forming opinions long before she met Harry. I know.
I know. It, it was uh, one heck of a discovery. And, of course, we're going to be keeping on uh, this legal case. Sam Markle uh, will be here next week to all going to plan. So, Lady Colin Campbell, Phil Dampier, our Royal Masterminds, thank you so much. Of course, both sides of the story here on GB News. And we must point out that Harry and Meghan have always denied that Meghan had any knowledge of the royal family in the years before she met her prince. Coming up, as Keir Starmer banishes Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party despite years parroting his hard-left propaganda, is Starmer one of the most dishonest politicians of our generation? My superstar panel discuss the Labour Party's civil war that's broken out. That's in the media bars after 10. But first, after a decade of punishing taxes and financial uncertainty brought on by her deranged push for a second referendum, has Sturgeon's separatist obsession condemned Scots to a bleak future? Ex-Tory Minister Anne Widdicombe weighs in on the SNP figurehead's catastrophic economic, economic legacy. She's live straight after the break. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion, and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Time now for Big Witty Star with former Tory Minister Anne Widdicombe and the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon rocked the nation this week and she leaves Scotland in a much worse position than when she took power back in 2014. Edinburgh think tank These Islands has slammed her high-tax, low-growth economic legacy that has left both Scottish earnings and business confidence in tatters. Individual earnings in Scotland have declined sharply compared to the rest of the UK and the damage to innovation and investment has been even more destructive after eight 
years of endless uncertainty caused by Sturgeon's deranged push for a second illegal vote on separatism. So, Anne, has scheming Sturgeon's separatist obsession battered business and actually ended up making Scots poorer? Oh, it certainly has. I mean, Scotland is a lot worse off on several indices. Uh, the NHS in Scotland uh, is uh, much worse than it was when uh, Nicola Sturgeon took over. Uh, education uh, results have declined since Nicola Sturgeon took over. Uh, you've just seen the uh, the economic figures. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, what has happened is she's become a victim of her own arrogance. She thought that as long as she was always picking a fight with Westminster, you know, the Scots would support her. And then she picked the wrong fight uh, over her extreme uh, transgender uh, policies. She picked entirely the wrong fight. The Scottish public were not with her. Uh, a few days ago, 42% of them were saying that she ought to go. Um, and she's gone. And I think Scotland will be the better for it. And Anne, before she took power, Sturgeon said publicly, judge me on education. That will be the measure that you can judge whether I'm a success or failure. Well, she certainly uh, has to give herself a fail mark then because education oh. standards, especially for deprived kids in Scotland, have gone down the drain. Absolutely. And, and the tragedy of it is that Scottish education standards used to be very high. You know, they used yes, to be the envy of the UK. They were they were very high, and then they were you know respected abroad. And and yet she's managed to squander all of that. And her focus has always been on rallying with Westminster, doing something different with Westminster. I mean, we went through COVID with Nicola Sturgeon always doing something different from what Westminster was doing, or nearly always, at any rate, uh, as a matter of principle. You know, she had to be doing something that was different. Um, and then, of course, she came up against them, uh, first of all, over the second referendum. And Westminster said no, and it's unlawful. And the court said no, and it's unlawful. So she's stuck there. Um, and having previously said, you know, that that first referendum was going to decide the issue, you know, for a generation, um, she now didn't get the result she wanted. So, uh, like others I could mention, she decides she's going to uh, try and rerun the referendum. And then finally, I, the last straw was just the transgender policy well, um, because it made no sense at all. It wasn't just the prisoner, the rapist, uh, going to a women's prison. It was her law that said, you know, that children could decide oh, I know. Uh, to to end us. Awful. I mean, and it's a sick law. It's actually a sick and twisted law. She could have voted uh, voted for that amendment to at least protect the victims of child sex abuse or rapes in court, and she didn't, which said a lot about her. But, Anne, looking at it from a macro level, isn't it the risk of when a politician becomes so detached from reality? For so long, Anne, she was surrounded by sycophants. Uh, she was surrounded by a soft Scottish media that largely loved her. She certainly was surrounded by a Westminster media that always wanted to put her on a pedestal. And she completely lost the understanding of what Scottish people, ordinary Scottish people, even, by the way, in the SNP, what they really felt. Yes, and she let the whole thing go to her head in much the same way that Theresa May uh, let things go to her head. You know, and you always have to be a bit detached from your own propaganda and your own publicity. Uh, and you, you, you take a healthily cynical attitude towards it if, if you've got any sense of self-preservation. Uh, but Nicola Sturgeon just fell in love with her own image. And Anne, it was a laughable moment in the press conference yesterday when she claimed that she'll be remembered as a feminist, as someone who always put women's <laughs> rights first. Because actually, Anne, I would argue she has done more than any other leader in modern times to actually reverse the rights of biological women in Scotland. Uh, indeed. And I mean, I don't think she knows you know, quite how to define a biological woman. Uh, but yep. she's certainly done nothing about protecting them. She didn't in, in the case of the rapist going to a woman's prison. Uh, she didn't in the case of her transgender law. She is not a feminist. Uh, she is wholly, I think, devoted uh, to the cause of Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, the cause of Nicola Sturgeon, which she thought was going to be advanced by an extreme woke agenda. But as we know, go woke, go broke. Uh, Anne Whittacombe, former Tory minister, with a withering verdict on the career 
of Nicola Sturgeon. But coming up, despite the campaign of hate directed at JK Rowling by trans extremists, did she end up emerging victorious over Sturgeon? Free speech champion Toby Young explores that at 10.20. But next, as Keir Starmer banishes his former minister, Jeremy Corbyn, despite spending years touting his socialist propaganda, can Slippery Starmer be trusted at all? My superstar panel return to discuss that. Plus, we've got the first newspaper front pages straight after the break. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, Labour claims the fall of Nicola Sturgeon is a game changer for their election prospects. But as the party plunges into another bitter war with, uh, with the Corbynites, are wide open seats in Scotland about to slip through their fingers? That's our big debate. Labour's civil war next. And tonight on my superstar panel, I'm joined by Sarah Vine, Sean Bailey and Austin Sheridan. After seeing off the Dark Lord, a.k.a. Scotland's First Minister, the author of Harry Potter has given a rare landmark interview on the aptly named new podcast, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. I never set out to upset anyone. However, I was not uncomfortable with getting off my pedestal. So have trans extremists led a modern day witch trial against J.K. Rowling? Free speech hero Toby Young condemns the cancellation live in the studio at 10.15. As Lancashire Police reveal details about Nicola Bully's issues with alcohol and the menopause, are officers' duty bound to be transparent or does this only encourage the armchair detectives intruding on their investigation? We're going to discuss the shocking case of the missing mother that has captivated the nation at 10.30. Plus, as it's left to working class people to voice the alarming effects of the migrant crisis, is the false stigmatisation as far right racist going to cost lives? Fleet Street icon Calvin McKenzie takes on the snaring liberal elite in Uncancelled at 10.40. In the media buzz, Sam Smith is now making up his own language. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to be a fish, fish of them. And the Sussexes have featured in a new TV interview but I really enjoyed this one. Our Instagram-loving wife actually doesn't want her privacy. How dare you, sir? My Instagram-loving wife has always wanted her privacy! Stay tuned for those astonishing moments on the BBC One show and South Park. I'm going to show you them this hour. 
And finally, is King Charles about to receive an early coronation? When I reveal tonight's greatest Britain and union jackass, the first front pages will arrive in mere moments too, right after Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you, and good evening to you. The top story on GB News tonight. The Prime Minister has arrived in Northern Ireland this evening amid speculation that a deal could be close over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Rishi Sunak made the journey with the Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton-Harris to hold talks with all political parties there. The UK and EU have been in intense talks to secure improvements to the post-Brexit trade deal. Well, now expectations are growing that new terms could be set out in the next few days. Sir Keir Starmer has made a surprise visit to Ukraine to meet with President Zelensky. The Labour leader pledged that support for Kyiv will continue if his party comes to power. Sir Keir also visited the cities of Bukha and Irpin, where he was shown evidence of alleged atrocities committed by Russian troops. And during the trip, he called for Russia to face justice in The Hague. Throughout the conflict, the Labour Party has stood united with the government in the United Kingdom um, to show our support for Ukraine. And we will have an election next year, um, and there may well be a change of government. But should there be a change of government next year in a general election, there will be no change in the position of support for Ukraine, both during the conflict and in the cause for justice. The Scottish National Party has postponed a planned conference on independence following the resignation of First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. The party's chief executive committee announced the news this evening, saying the event would be rescheduled. Meanwhile, a ballot to select a new party leader will close on the 27th of March. That comes amid reports that the health secretary, Humza Yousaf, is expected to end the leadership contest. Lancashire Police has referred itself to the police watchdog over contact they had with Nicola Bully and her husband Paul Ansell prior to her disappearance. The force says it was called to Nicola's home on January the 10th, 17 days before she went missing. And that comes after yesterday detectives unexpectedly revealed that the 45-year-old was vulnerable and that she'd been struggling with alcohol and the menopause. Earlier, Miss Bully's family said the public focus now seemed to be more about appalling speculation into her private life than actually finding her. And lastly, Bruce Willis, the actor, has been diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia, the most common form of the condition found in people under the age of 60 years old. And warning, the following footage does contain some flash photography. Last spring, the actor announced his retirement after being diagnosed with aphasia, which affected his cognitive abilities. But now his family say the condition has progressed. Describing the news as painful, they say that now they hope media attention will shine a light on the disease. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Now it's Dan Wooden tonight. Tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. Just one front page in so far tonight. It's the Metro, uh, which leads with the headline, Just Focus on Finding Nikki. That's after missing Nicola Bully's family hit out at public speculation over the mother of two's personal life. We're going to bring you much more on that story at 10.30. Plus, the paper nods towards South Park's scathing takedown of the Sussexes. You'll see more of that episode. I'm going to show you some of the best bits, actually, a little bit later on. My superstar panel back with me now, though. Top Daily Mail columnist Sarah Vine, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, and SNP star Austin Sheridan. Now, after Queen Nick sensationally quit as Scottish leader yesterday, leaving her SNP cronies in the lurch, Labour have become tipped to win back seats north of the border and charge into number 10. But yet another civil war has erupted among the opposition benches after Keir Starmer axed his old body, buddy Jeremy Corbyn as a candidate for the next election. Now, that's provoked fury among sections of the party, with Corbyn, Disciple and Guardian loudmouth Owen Jones writing Keir Starmer 
served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, campaigned for him to become prime minister, defended him from accusations of anti-Semitism, called him a friend, promised to keep his radical domestic policies. He is one of the most dishonest politicians of the modern era. And look, I understand if you don't want to take Owen's word for it, he can't be trusted, can he? But here are the receipts. I'm 100% behind Jeremy you, Corbyn. You are, no. I am working with Jeremy Corbyn yeah. to try to win the next general election. And don't trash the last four years, because what Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> brought to this party, he made us an anti-austerity party that stood against cuts. You were loyal to Jeremy Corbyn and you've spoken in his defence just now. But Louise Elman says that he is a danger not just to the Labour Party, but to the entire British Jewish community. I don't accept that. I, I mean, Sean Bailey, I do understand that on face value, Sturgeon's resignation should be very good news for Labour. Uh, Labour, to get a majority, really needs to do well in Scotland. That's always traditionally been the case. But how can we trust a word that this bloke says? I think there's two things to separate out. The first thing is, he said he held Jeremy Corbyn up because of his anti-Semitic views, but he supported Jeremy at that point. So to conveniently drop him now because of that doesn't make any sense. And it's that kind of double speak, that kind of change of direction. Well, he wanted to be prime minister. Well, now. But it's that kind of change of direction that makes people distrust politicians. So I think that's really important. But the second piece about Scotland, um, Labour doing well in Scotland, let's be clear, the SNP isn't just Nicola Sturgeon. Mm. And it'll be SNP um, politicians really figuring out how to beat Labour. They've done it before and they can probably do it again. And that's why you've seen they've so very quickly put down Nicola. They thought, OK, Nicola's going to be a problem, let's get rid of her, and they have, and they'll be up there campaigning. The challenge for them will be their record. I'd argue that their record doesn't bear really close scrutiny. No. There'll be other people say different things. But Labour, if Labour think they're going to walk all over the SNP, I think they're in for a tough fight. Mm. Sarah Vine, I guess the issue is, though, that there isn't any form of domestic agenda for the SNP to campaign on at the next election. So whoever comes in as the new leader yeah. is going to have some sort of plan for separatism, but but what will it be? There, there's no moral path, there's no political path, there's no legal path. No, no, no. But, I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, going back to, going back to Keir Starmer, yeah. is he's detoxifying his brand very heavily at the moment, which is a little bit what the SNP are doing mm -hmm. by, Lewis, by losing Sturgeon. But is that, it working? Because Well, I don't know, because I think a lot of people will... I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is, is, is the sort of thorn in, in Labour's side. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, the, he's, the, he's the sort of people that... He, a lot of people will look at Keir Starmer and if he's not got Jeremy Corbyn hanging off him, they might think, OK, I could vote for that guy, but they won't if they think that Corbyn and all of that lot... But then why didn't he quit the shadow cabinet? I mean, to me... It's such a fundamental. Well, because he didn't think that he didn't th he didn't think that he was going to get to where he is now. So he's 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 changing he's the goalposts. He he yeah, is he's just an, he's yeah. just an opportunist, really. He, he, he's a crazy. And, and what he understands is people's memories are very yeah. short. Your average person is trying to figure out how to make yeah. ends meet. Not if Starmer supported no. Corbyn. Also and the thing is, there's nothing underneath the surface with Keir Starmer. It's just what he thinks <clears> plays <throat> well, and that's yeah. what he's doing. I mean, yeah. there's literally it's uh, it's this thin. Mm -hmm. Austin, do you feel like Labour are going to be much more of a threat now that Sturgeon's gone? No, I mean, Keir Starmer's weak. That's his problem. Um, so it was under Corbyn. It was supporting Corbyn, saying, I'm going to back you. Mm. Um, now that he's a leader, it's, a, he, he, it's like double, it is like double speak. Mm. But then when it comes to any issues, like say, for example, before um, the Tories implemented Section 35 to block the GRA reform, before they'd done that, it was asked on the news, would you use Section 35? Couldn't have given an answer. Yeah. He was asked, um, oh, I support gender recognition reform. And he said, well, what reform do you support? Couldn't have given an answer. What kind of leader is that? This is a man what who can't even say what a woman is. No, it's so that kind yeah, of woman yeah, yeah, can't yeah. answer that, the that question. That was the telling yeah, thing. That, but, you know, can a woman have a penis who can't answer the yeah, question? But the, the thing with, 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 with him, he's... He's as wide as a sea, but as deep as a puddle. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think when it comes to election time and hard questions are asked, yeah. the public will but see But the that. danger is, the danger is, is that people will think he's plausible because yes. he's sort of vanilla in that, you know, they don't... Yeah. They, inoffensive. He's, he's a, inoffensive. I don't know, I disagree with that. I, I, I think that will put people off at the end of the day because people will look at him, they'll say, what is it you're going to deliver? If you look at the success of Boris Johnson in 2019, whether you yeah. like him or love yeah. him, he came out with a, with a clear message, get Brexit done, yeah. and that resonated with people because 
because he, at least people knew what he wanted yeah. to do. Jeremy Corbyn was all over the place. My something. worry is, is that Corbyn would now stand for Mayor of London because there's nowhere yeah. else yes. for him to go. Yes, I think... That's oh. great news. Though, <laughs> but yeah. by the way, as well... The Tories will come through the middle. Sean <laughs> might be back. He might be off the sofa <laughs> and in City Hall. Uh, look, breaking tonight, the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, John Swinney, has ruled himself out as a candidate. He isn't going to be standing to replace Nicola Sturgeon. He was one of the early favourites. Austin, your reaction? I think that was a sensible thing for John Swinney to do. Um, old, uh, old bloke, well, yesterday's no, man. No, not at all. John Swinney was a SNP leader before, between, between yeah, 2000 and 2004. And, you know, and it, it just wasn't the, the kind of... The, the presenter that they were going to plan. Right? No, he's the brains behind the operation. Um, oh, when it comes me, to 2007, ever since the SNP been the government to, in 2007, it's such a massive ministerial portfolio, had so much to offer, and he's still going to have so much to offer. But John Swinney Awful knows. John Swinney course. knows where his strengths are, mm -hmm. um, and whoever becomes the SNP Not leader, the whoever becomes the SNP leader, uh, will, will very, will, will very benefit from he's his a support. Politician, is he? <laughs> now, look, at last weekend's British Awards, John Binary singer Sam. Smith was typically OTT, committing crimes against fashion. Uh, you know this, don't you, for the red carpet monstrosity of an outfit. Uh, it was quite something. <laughs> uh, but a past experience on The One Show has just exploded online after it somehow managed to sip through the net. Literally, look. I'm a big fan of fishing. I do love no. fishing, yeah. yes, I do. What? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to be a fish fisher than... What, like a fly fisherman? I'd, I'd be... A, I'd be... Any type of fish of them. I think I would like to... One day, I'd just like to end my days fishing. Like we can solve that. Do you fly yeah. fishing? Or I do it on the sea and I do it in the lakes. I've never done it alone. So cool. Someone's always taught me. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Go yeah. Seriously, what? fish of them. I mean, good on presenter Alex Jones for refusing to take part in that ridiculous charade. Uh, but Sarah Vine. This is becoming laughable now, isn't I it? Think, I think Sam Smith has just worked out that if he's just... If he just is ridiculous. Everyone's going to. Pay he nearly said to him. fisherman. Though. He, no, he he did. He's obviously been told by his manager just just be as sort of crazy as you possibly can because that's what gets lots of retweets. But Austin, you've signed up to this this wokery, haven't you? Well, Fisher them. What I believe, right, is that if people want to be known as they them, it's it's no offensive to me. It doesn't do me any harm. Um, to respect that that so decision. That, now, now, for me, I'm not a, I'm not trans. I'm not non-binary. If people say to me, "What's it like to be trans? What's it like to be non-binary?" The answer would be, "I have no clue." Right? Do I so under think do I understand Smith is just it? An no. Because I knew Sam Smith. I think right. Sam. I think Sam Smith is an attention seeker, um, but I don't think that it's the they them. Um, that really matters. I think that Sam Smith is just generally looking for attention and, he's, and Listen, Sam that... Smith is looking to, to, to promote their album, so yeah. they're going to do everything they can to do that. That, that outfit, if you, if you needed any confirmation that Sam Smith is seeking attention, yeah. that outfit should, should, yeah. should let you know yeah. where he exactly. is. Exactly. But you know what? I'm fine for Sam Smith to seek attention. Yeah. Pop stars have always sought attention. What I'm not fine with is for that attention to lead to the removal of awards for women yeah. at the Brit yes, Awards. Yes. I'm with you which on that. And also for actors, which will yeah. come yes, soon. Yes, that's coming well. next, yeah. isn't it? That's going to yeah. be the Hollywood movie. Yeah. And also, butchering our beautiful but, language. But, but, that, but that's... The, the, the challenge is, he... he, he we should respect his pronouns. That's his business. Yeah. But what you should happen is... Yeah, yeah. I've got to say that. That's a good point. Because yeah, I'm struggling. I'm <laughs> <obviously, laughs> We should we respect, respect their pronouns. Yeah. No, this it's is awful. I'm, I'm, but the point is, I shouldn't be told off, cancelled, because I yeah. get it wrong. People have to tolerate people moving to that position. Yeah. But let's be clear, I'll, I'll support him to do that, but he cannot ask me to remove my need to use the word fisherman or, or me to be yeah. known as a man. That's the key but thing. But you're not... He's done it again. <laughs> fisherman thing I'm going to hold on to. I want to be very clear, I'm going to hold on hard to the fisherman thing. I, I quite like the jumper, though. Yeah, it was yeah, nice. nice Sean Manley, Austin, Sherrod and Sarah Pine, it's the most conservative thing he's worn in <laughs> months. <laughs> now, coming up, in the media buzz, as the police are accused of victim blaming in the case of missing mother Nicola Bully, were they wrong to reveal personal details of alcohol abuse? My superstar panel are going to return to get stuck into that. Plus, we'll have more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages just after 10.30. But next, as Sturgeon's most famous critic, J.K. Rowling, speaks out in a bombshell new podcast, is the hunting and cancellation of the Harry Potter author no more than a modern-day witch trial? Social commentator, founder of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young, has his say live straight after the break.
First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, that's my you, ringtone. You, no. My political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Time now for free speech champion Toby Young. And one woman, no doubt celebrating Nicola Sturgeon's demise, is her most famous critic, J.K. Rowling. The pair viciously clashed over the trans debate, with the Harry Potter author becoming a hate figure in some quarters for simply sticking up for the rights of biological women. But in a landmark podcast series, which is going to start next week, called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, the billionaire writer is given a rare interview on how she risked her legacy to speak the truth. I never set out to upset anyone. However, I was not uncomfortable with getting off my pedestal. And what has interested me over the last 10 years, and certainly in the last few years, the last two, three years, particularly on social media, you've ruined your legacy. Oh, you could have been beloved forever, but you chose to say this. And I think you could not have misunderstood me more profoundly. Oh, she's brilliant isn't she? So Toby Young, I guess it's like Harry Potter seeing Voldemort off in, in, one of, <laughs> uh, in one of her books. Rowling did it really, didn't she? She was a significant player in terms of turning public opinion yeah, well, in Sturgeon. I, I think it might be a little unfair on J.K. Rowling to describe her as the architect 
of Nicola Sturgeon's demise. Nicola Sturgeon was the architect mm -hmm. of her own Sturgeon. demise. Um, I think she, she, she certainly uh, drew attention to the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, uh, which has just passed through the Scottish Parliament and which Nicola Sturgeon championed and which will, when it comes into force, make it much easier for trans people to self-ID. Um, uh, and she was, a, she was a, an outspoken opponent of that legislation. Um, and certainly, I think that probably galvanised opposition. It, it empowered other people who felt uncomfortable about that legislation and thought it would lead to women's sex-based rights being eroded, it empowered them to speak up. And, and that's what I think that's, that's, that's really the, the, the impressive thing um, about J.K. Rowling is by standing up and speaking out about this issue and taking all this flack, she's nonetheless made it easier. She's almost acted as a human shield for other feminists mm. and other people who are really concerned about this issue. And they've, they, they've, they can now speak up too because she's made it OK to speak up about it. And the tide has started to turn, hasn't it? Because remember, J.K. Rowling was completely cancelled by polite society, by Hollywood society. I mean, she can't yeah. be cancelled as a businesswoman because, of course, the Harry Potter franchise remains so important for Warner Brothers, such a huge money spinner. She's not invited to the awards anymore. The, the stars don't post selfies with her anymore. Uh, there's definitely been a change. However, all of a sudden, the Gender Recognition Reform Bill made many folk, including on the hard left, the woke left, think, oh, goodness me. I'm a bit of a turf too, because I don't want Adam Graham in a woman's prison. I don't want Adam Graham, the double rapist, in my daughter's changing rooms. And Sturgeon's position, uh, sorry, and Rowling's position no longer looks extreme. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, uh, trans rights activists would always accuse gender critical feminists and others who would raise this issue. You know, if you make it easier to, for people to self-identify, um, if they don't have to live for very long in a different sex, if it's just really a question of just announcing which gender you identify as, then that's going to make it much easier uh, for dangerous male criminals um, to access women's only spaces. Um, and when, when people talked about the risk that posed to women in prison, if male prisoners identifying as women can get access, sex offenders, to women's prisons, that would be described as a straw man. A straw man argument. Oh, yeah. But, but, but Adam Graham... Not only a straw man argument, you're also a bigot. You were a transphobe. Yep, we'll, we'll come on to that in a second. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but uh, the, 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 Isla Bryson, yeah. as he calls himself, was the straw man come to life. You may think of himself as a woman, but he was a, the straw man come to life. It wasn't a fanciful yeah. scenario yeah, 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 yeah. dreamt up Very by good. paranoid GC feminists. It was real. Uh, and I think that, 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 that's ultimately what did it for Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. Of course, um, J.K. Rowling has been accused of being a bigot and a transphobe because she's spoken up about this issue. But interestingly, when, when people are actually asked to identify, point to something transphobic she said, they can't find anything. Um, so a journalist called E.J. Rosetta, who is an LGBTQAI activist, um, was asked by the Huffington Post to do 20, the 20 most transphobic things J.K. Rowling has ever said. And she was absolutely convinced herself that J.K. Rowling was a transphobe. You know, she drunk, transphobe, she drunk the Kool-Aid on that one. She looked, she read all of her works, read everything she'd ever written, listened to all the interviews she'd ever done, couldn't find a single transphobic thing she'd said. And so she then wrote a piece, which was very honest of her, saying, actually, I was wrong. Mm. Uh, I couldn't find any. I don't think she is a transphobe. Um, and uh, to describe anyone who opposes some of the more extreme demands of trans rights activists as a transphobe or a bigot or a turf is just a way of trying to shut down debate, of silencing someone, of trying to cancel them. It's not engaging in the argument. And I think the fact that trans rights activists have behaved in that way and not engaged constructively in the argument uh, is one of the reasons they're losing the argument in the public square. It's incredible listening to JK speaking on that podcast. And I think the tone is moving towards her. I don't know if you saw, but there was this, this great moment where some idiot on Twitter, it's called JJ Wells, tweeted, well, this is to JK Rowling, right? Well, well, well. We meet at last. To think you were once an icon to me, I think you absolutely have views that align with Nazis. I think Fred also has views that align with Nazis. I think relying on tropes and stereotypes is very 1930s propaganda. So J.K. Rowling replied and said, okie dokie, J.J., we'll play it your way. Uh, give my regards to your solicitors. Wink. Uh, within a few hours, 
JJ Wells has tweeted saying, I would like to publicly apologise for a previous Twitter thread where I interacted with JK Rowling on matters relating to the transgender community. I have now removed those tweets and would like to apologise to JK Rowling directly for causing potential upset. I failed to choose my words with care. I would also like to retract my likening to JK Rowling to any far right or Nazi organisation. It goes on and on and on. Mm. And I think this is brilliant, actually, because she's one of the few people mm. uh, with the money and the power to actually say to the woke left, you can't just repeat what you've heard. You mm. don't have any evidence mm. for these claims you're mm. making against Yeah, me. no, it's uh, very effective. Um, I mean, the difficulty is, of course, that um, so many other women who express support now for J.K. Rowling get into trouble merely for expressing their solidarity with her. So we've got a member of the Free Speech Union, um, a writer called Gillian Phillip, and she lost her job writing, uh, working for a publishing company. She was the author of several successful novels. Uh, she lost her job just because she, in her Twitter, she, on Twitter, she, she tweeted, I stand with J.K. Rowling, hashtag I stand with J.K. Rowling. And she got fired, you know, young employees at the publishing company were up in arms about it. We can't work with this woman anymore. She's a danger to trans people just because she tweeted, hashtag I stand with J.K. Rowling, and she lost her job and had to retrain as an HGV driver. Um, and we're still, we're still trying to get justice for her. Yeah, she's been on the show, actually, and a, a really brilliant woman, and it was shocking. But look, what I love about this podcast, which comes out next week, is Rowling says, you misunderstand me if you think I give a damn about being cancelled by your little cocktail parties in Hollywood. This is a mission for her. It is a cause. And I think in the end, I really do think she's going to win. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 if you care about these issues and you care about the risks to women posed by self-ID, you couldn't hope for a better champion. I mean, you know, she's Indeed. the world's best-selling author. Totally, totally. Uh, she's, she's an you know, incredibly articulate, I, I don't agree passionate. with J.K. Rowling, really, politically. I don't like her politics on either, on, on, on other issues. Absolutely. Yep. But, my goodness, she now has my respect. Uh, Toby Young, Editor-in-Chief of the Daily Skeptic website, thank you so much. But coming up in Uncancelled, are Brits being unfairly demonised for their reluctance to host hordes of undocumented migrants in their communities? Giving his unfiltered views on this, Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie. But next, in the media buzz, as Lancashire police come under fire for revealing details of missing Nicola Bully's alcohol misuse to the public, was it fair or even relevant to share these past issues with the public? My superstar panel are going to thrash this one out very soon. Plus, Harry and Meghan might be multimillionaires, but it's come at a great cost to their dignity. You've lived a life with the royal family, you've had everything handed to you, but you say your life has been hard, and now you've written all about it in your new book, When. Burn. Stay tuned for much more from South Park's humiliating takedown of the Montecito Monas. That's next. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10am. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. We'll engage in passionate, but always 
polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the center of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. More front pages are in and the Daily Telegraph leads with this breaking news that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has flown to Belfast to try and end the post-Brexit protocol deadlock over border trade in Northern Ireland. The I reports on the call from MPs and poverty campaigners for British gas owner Centrica to use its record £3.3 billion profit to compensate vulnerable families who were forced onto pre-payment me uh, meters. The Sun leads with missing Nicola Bully and that emotional call from her family urging her to come home. More on that in just one moment. And the Daily Mail also leading with that story and the fact that the Home Secretary, Suala Braverman, has piled pressure on the police over their chaotic investigation. She's said to be concerned by the decision of the Lancashire Constabulary to release highly personal information about the 45-year-old. My superstar panel return now, though. Top Daily Mail columnist Sarah Vine, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, and former SNP councillor Austin Sheridan. And breaking tonight, as we just heard, the family of Missy Nicola Bully have pleaded for people to stop making up wild theories about her personal life. Responding to the aftermath of yesterday's revelation by Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith about Nicola's issues with alcohol brought on by her struggles with the menopause, the family said, Although we know that Nikki would not have wanted this, there are people out there speculating and threatening to sell stories about her. This is appalling and needs to stop. Nikki is such a wonderful daughter, sister, partner and mother and is missed dearly. We all need you back in our lives. Lancashire Police are now facing angry accusations of victim blaming that prompted its self-referral to the police watchdog this evening. It's nearly three weeks since Nicola mysteriously vanished while walking her dog across a stretch of the River Wire in rural Lancashire with police, private investigators and divers involved in the search. Now, until now, I haven't covered this case on the show, but in light of yesterday's briefing, it has now, in my opinion, become a national issue of competence and confidence in the police. So, Sarah Vine, this has now got to the Home Secretary. Mm. What happened? Because I watched the press conference in full yesterday and the Lancashire police were clear that they were not going to reveal mm. these personal informations against mm. the family's wishes about Missy Nicola. Then a few hours later they came did, yeah. a statement about the menopause and the booze and the call to her home. So what changed? And it's, and it's so weird because I don't understand what material difference the public knowing that about her will make to the police's ability to find her. I mean, it's not going to make any difference, the fact that we know that she was menopausal or all that she liked to drink, is it? It just feels like they're just trying to shift blame. It's almost like they're saying... Well, she was a bit of a drunk and a bit old, and so therefore she's, yeah. she, you know, she's not, she's not a normal person. So that's why she's gone missing. Not, not we're incompetent and we can't find her. I mean, who knows what's happened to her? But the one thing I would say is that when this case first started, I noticed that on social media channels, particularly on TikTok, there were a lot of members of the public random people speculating all sorts of stuff which you know, would never have got into a mainstream newspaper because would have been completely libelous about her husband about her family about her and it seems that there's there's there has this this case has sort of gone completely 
sort of wild online with people just mm. talking nonsense about this poor family. And so perhaps they did it as a response because, they, as they said, you know, there was a lot of gossip, there was a lot of speculation, people were saying terrible things, so they felt they had to say something. Mm. And, and so in a, in a wider sense, it tells us something about the world that we live in, which is that, you know, the police can't conduct an investigation into a missing person in a kind of normal and considered fashion because they're up against this sort of crazed mm. social media environment where people, you know, can't be the prosecuted. Of social yeah, media. exactly. And, I mean, I do have some sympathy from that position, Sean, but the issue with Detective Superintendent Rebecca Smith is that it feels like she's more interested in us covering. I've got to say I have absolutely no sympathy for what the police did. What they've done is made her more vulnerable, not less vulnerable. If she is somewhere now wandering around, people know where her weaknesses are, people know what she's struggling with. And I actually thought it's very mean to talk about her menopausal situation and it led to her drinking. It just felt mean-spirited to me. And I go to your point, Dan, it did feel like the police were saying she's gone missing because she's, you know, a little bit not like the rest of us. We can't find her because she's not like, it's like the rest of us. It's her fault that her she's fault. gone missing. That's and basically what they're saying. And, and, I thought, and you know me, I'm a person who always tries to support the police. But in this particular case, I thought their behaviour is very out of order. The only thing I'll say in the defence of the police is because they get tried in the press mm. so much. We need a police service in this country that is confident enough to do its job and not worry what the yeah. press is saying and not worry what's going mm -hmm. on on social media. Indeed, yeah. I guess, Austin, one of the concerns is, though, in this three weeks when the police were saying, look, our main hypothesis is that she's fallen in the river, uh, sightings of her may have been missed by the public. And, of course, the family today issued a very emotional direct plea to Nicola. So they clearly think there's at least a possibility, the family think there's at least a possibility that she has either run away to try and escape her life or been kidnapped. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there, there absolutely is the possibility. And the fact that the police decided to release this personal information, you know, so hurtful to her family, so hurtful to her person, she's got access... You know, you know, to media, and she's seen this. It could be absolutely counterproductive. I think the mm -hmm. police have been completely mm. irresponsible, and there's not very much at all that I agree with Suella Braverman on. I can assure you that, but I'm really <laughs> glad that she's going to. I hope she does intervene, mm. and I hope she Suella. takes some serious okay. actions. Let me just play devil's advocate for one moment, though, Sarah. Can you imagine if a journalist at any newspaper? were to discover this week, before the police released their statement, that they had been called mm. to Nicola Bully's mm. house on the 10th of January mm. and that wasn't reported by the police, mm. the public would potentially think that there was some sort of cover-up going on. So, while I think there's no excuse for releasing the information about the menopause and the drinking, mm. was there at least a case for saying, no. we did visit her house previously no, because there's because an ongoing got, police no, investigation. No, because it's, got no, it's, it's, it's not relevant. The public doesn't need to know that. Yeah. that it mm. really is not necessary for the public to know that. Why should they know that there was a... a, a and, and I go back to my point. The police should not be conducting investigations mm. with an eye on what the media are going to mm. say. If the police think something is technically necessary, they should go right ahead and do it. This reminds me of what happened with, with the media circus around the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Mm. I was saying that earlier, actually. Is police handled mm. so badly, yep. which is that which is that you, you know the police have a duty to be considered and and very meticulous about this sort of stuff. And the mm. second that they open it up to well, I mean mm. now social media, which you didn't have back in those days, everything mm. just goes pear shaped. And they don't have a right to confirm and expose people in their private lives. Yeah. I mean, mm. I mean, if people have got a personal problem to deal with, that's that's no, that's no business to the police. Right. And the, the fact that they release that to the general public mm. is disgraceful. Yeah. The clue is in the personal. Mm. It's a yeah. personal thing. Indeed. Mm. And the reality is they didn't know for sure that she had yes. fallen in the river. They never did. So it would have been better to be more honest with the public mm. about the other two hypotheses mm. that they were also it, looking it, at. It's not even a case of honesty. It's just technical ability. Mm. Any police force should have thought, unless we have a concrete evidence or something, mm. we will stand mm. back and reserve judgment. That's literally their job. And I'd like to believe by referring themselves to the police watchdog, somebody will point that out to them. Mm. OK. Uh, now, look, the Tide State side seems to have turned firmly against Harry and Meghan. After months of childish sniping through podcasts, broadcast interviews and Harry's vile memoir spare, the insufferable pair have now landed exactly where they belong, on the satirical cartoon South Park. And it's brutal. Watch. The Prince and his wife. Yeah. We, we want, want privacy. privacy! We want privacy! Yeah. Right, thanks for having us on the show. 
It's so awesome to be here. It's great. So let me start with you, sir. You've lived a life with the royal family. You've had everything handed to you, but you say your life has been hard, and now you've written all about it in your new book, Wee. Yes, that's right, friend. You see, my wife and I are totally like you should write a book because your family like stupid and then so are like journalists. So you hate journalists. That's right. And now you wrote a book that reports on the lives of the royal family. Right. So you're a journalist. We just want to be normal people. All this attention is so hard. Isn't it true, sir, that your questionable wife has her own TV show and hangs out with celebrities and does fashion magazines? What are you suggesting? Well, I just think some people might say that your Instagram-loving wife actually doesn't want her privacy. How dare you, sir! My Instagram-loving wife has always wanted her privacy! And you know what else? To hell with Canada! We are leaving! We'll go find some quiet place where we can be normal people! Come on, wife! We want privacy! We, we want, want privacy! privacy. Oh, perfection. I mean, they might be multi-millionaires, right? But I would say the Sussexes have now traded away their dignity and any kudos they once had, they once had in the US. I mean, Sarah Vine... You can't cancel South Park. People. You can't cancel no. South Park. But these were the exact people who they thought were their pals. I know. It's quite funny. But, I mean, that is very succinct, that little sketch, but it really does say it all, doesn't it? It does. And it's, that, that's it. I mean... It's the absurdity. Yeah. yeah. Of exactly. their position. It's, it's, it's completely hypocritical and total lack of self-knowledge and just extraordinary. And this is what we've all been saying yeah. for months and months and months and months, and yet we still get attacked for saying it. So Well, indeed. You know. I mean, Sean, I always said, be warned, mm. the American media is brutal. Mm. And the difference is they don't care that you're royal. Mm. You're yeah. just a two-bit celebrity to them. By the way, Harry and Meghan, this might sound cruel, you're not even on the A-list mm. in yeah. Hollywood. Royal, you're on the B-list. Royalty in Hollywood is, is, is big movie stars, the likes of Tom Cruise yeah. and the likes, so they were never going to be treated Alan DeGeneres, same. Oprah, yeah. Kim Kardashian, they're on the A-list. And Meghan didn't get invited to Oprah's birthday party. Oh, no, that was they, they were never going to get treated with a reverence they would do here because as much as Harry has, has deliberately separated himself from the family, there's still an air of he is a royal and, and the conversation mm. is slightly different. But I just go back to the beginning, like I've always said on this show, I wanted everybody to be family and make up and be friends. I think where that really went wrong, I think even Harry, born a royal, underestimated how difficult it would be to leave the royals. And now that they've done that, people are abandoning them in their droves. And, and it's an awful shame because I think almost any move they make now will end badly for them because people are out to get them. Well, they've spent a lot of their capital, haven't they? Yeah. Because the trouble is they've, they've basically given a lot away, given too much away, yeah. too many yeah. money shots, as, as, as we There's no say. going back. Austin, come on. And you, you're, you're a wokey. You're oh, a wokey say... hoping. Can, can you defend them anymore? I mean, if you leave the royal fam when you go and you, and you pursue a celebrity lifestyle, then you can't really complain too much when you're open to scrutiny, right? Yeah. Everybody's open to scrutiny. Are you still Just a fan? because they're royal. Do you, do you like them? Well, I, I was never a, I've never been a fan of, of the royals in general, to be perfectly honest with you. No, about Harry and Meghan? I, I've never been a fan of Harry and Meghan. What I would say is that I think that when they were in the family, um, I think that there may have been some scrutiny, some things said that shouldn't have been said. But now they've went and they've pursued this, they've opened it up to the public. Well, mm. if you're going to do that, then it's fair game. You have to be open to scrutiny. Mm. Some people are going to love it and support you. Some people are going to hate it. And that's just part and parcel that's of the, it. That's the irony. They're not open to scrutiny. In the court case, today, Sarah Vine, that they're, yeah. they're, they're saying, oh, their lawyers say, oh, no, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't sue for, for, for every, every little uh, opinion that you don't agree with in the media. Uh, hello, that's exactly what you've been doing for the past three years. Yeah, and, of course, Meghan's got this row with her sister as well, which is quite interesting, I think. Mm. But, of course, the big question is, will they come for the coronation? That's a fact. I mean, I don't find it interesting at all. I mean, I really don't care if Megan's <laughs> arguing yeah. with her sister. And, and I really don't care much about the coronation yeah. either. I think a lot of Scots agree with you. I, 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 I want to see the coronation. I think it's going to be great fun. i tell you why they should come to the coronation. Imagine this was your family. Would you separate your grandparents from their grandchildren? No, but I would never. In have my family, yes, yeah, 100%. I, 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 would, <laughs> no, I, I get it. I, 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 I would never have given an interview when my beloved 
grandfather was on his deathbed. I, I understand all that. My I, 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 I just say to anybody watching but this not now, normal. if you're watching this now and you're a grandparent, would you put up with your horrific exactly. children to get your grandchildren? Because I would. You know my big thing, everybody together. But they have made decisions, but they can't. There's some decisions that they don't have the right to make on behalf of their children. And to separate them from their family is one of the few things I believe parents shouldn't do. Mm. They should give their children an opportunity to be part of that family. But that's the thing, Dan. Is, is, is the real family isn't normal. It's not a normal family. It's, it's an institution. And see, to be honest with you, I couldn't think of anything worse than being part of the real family. That I really genuinely oh, oh. You see, I think, I think Prince, uh, King Tos, I keep calling him Prince, uh, King Tos, needs to separate his role as king from yep. his role as grandfather. And I think the coronation is a royal occasion. It's not really a family occasion. No, indeed. And therefore, and I, the problem uh, is this uh, given week... what they've done to the royal family, I probably would say no, don't yeah, because, come to that. Because... But come to a little private party afterwards and, uh, I would as say, family. bring my grandchildren mm. to my coronation. There's only one thing that should be more important to, to King Charles than being king, and that is his family, and particularly his grandchildren. Yeah. I think it's a real privilege to know your grandparents. But the issue is, the weakness that he's showing, I think, is allowing them to take advantage of the royal They're going to do that anyway, come on. Yeah. At what point have, have the Sussexes looked like they're going to stop? They're going to do that yeah, anyway. He should be focused on his grandchildren. OK, Sean Bailey, Sarah Vine, Austin Sheridan, thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to reveal tonight's greatest Britain and Union jackass. I wonder if the Sussexes might feature. But next, Calvin McKenzie is uncancelled on the migrant crisis. See you in a minute. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. It's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. And as we've been covering throughout the week, the arrest of four Afghan boys for the alleged rape of a British schoolgirl and the public outcry over accusations a 15-year-old girl was harassed by a 25-year-old asylum seeker has seen the channel Migrant Crisis once again infuriating ordinary Brits. But rather than tackle this difficult issue, the MSM and Liberal establishment have continued their campaign to demonise genuinely concerned locals by lazily branding them far-right extremists. Well, Fleet Street legend Calvin McKenzie joins me on this. Now, Calvin, is shutting down debate like this endangering lives by excusing illegal migrants who are actually a genuine threat to society, but most folk now seem too scared to have the debate in case they're called right wing? Well, I, I found it uh, bizarre uh, that uh, Lisa Nandy um, decided to take the cudgels up on this. 
I mean, uh, where where this problem existed in Liverpool and Osley is not far from Wigan, which is, which is her constituency. And uh, if, if they put in a, a, a large hotel there and filled them up with, with uh, channel migrants, illegal channel migrants, there'd be all hell to pay. So she doesn't even represent ordinary people, ordinary working people. If anybody has any view about life at all now, they are considered far right in an attempt by a, a really disgraceful collection, as you all know from your Twitter feed and any, anybody on social media, the most disgusting people are on the left. Yep. Vile. They, yep. I don't think, no wonder we have so many psychiatrists on the NHS. They must be dealing with these left wingers all day long. But there is another big <laughs> issue that's blowing up right now. Oh, yeah. The, the, the issue that's blowing up is in Turkey. So there's been this shocking earthquake. Yes. The inevitable outcome of that will be that there will be millions of displaced people. Mm. And the place that they will be going to, especially out of northern Syria and parts of southern Turkey, inevitably will be Europe. And the place that they know for absolutely certain they are not going to get sent back is the UK because once you once you arrive here, this is Hotel California. There is no getting out because the system, the 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 Labour Party, the lawyers, and actually probably the law means that these people are going to stay here. So out of every tragedy that we see going forward, and there will be other earthquakes and there'll be other wars and there'll be other issues in Africa and the Middle East, this issue about migration is either going to be solved or it is going to swamp us. And what I can't understand is why, uh, with the exception, I think, of Nigel Farage, why it is that, that there is no party that says, if we manage to solve this, there is a great electoral prize. The yeah. people of our country, the migrants here themselves, would cheer to the rooftops about it. No, absolutely right. Calvin McKenzie, thank you so much. Have a great week, and we will speak on Monday. But it is time now to reveal tonight's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. My superstar panel returns, Sarah Vine. Who, who are you going for for tonight's Greatest Britain? The King, because he turned up at a thing and then people had placards saying, you're not our king, hashtag not and not my king. And he just carried on. He was very sanguine about it. So I thought that was quite good. Oh, uh, yes, here it was. And I think, I think he actually went over and... Mm. Sort of spoke, spoke to people. Them, yeah. he, he didn't shy away from it. And I think he's going to have to be more like that, isn't, mm. isn't he, Sarah? Uh, Sean Bailey, your nominee. My nominee for Greatest Britain is everybody returning to work. Returning to work is good for us, it's good for your mental health, it's good for the economy. And if we're going to avoid a recession, we'll do it from work, not from our bedroom in our pyjamas. And Austin Sheridan, your greatest person. Shockingly, my greatest Britain's going to go to Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, mm. come on! Purely just to, you know, Scotland's longest serving First Minister. Um, you know, she's been through a tough time. Um, over oh, the past she's few put weeks. us through a tough time. <laughs> she's put your people through a tough time. Oh, look, I can't, I, I, I can't go with that. I'm going to go with King Charles because good on him for staring down the protest is he's going to have to do that more. Well done. Sarah Vine, uni and jackass time now. Who are you going for, Sarah? Uh, <laughs> Their Majesty's Lancashire Constabulary, I think. Oh, yeah. For getting it so catas catastrophically wrong in Obviously, this Obviously, we awful... were just talking, weren't we, about yeah. the Nicola Bully case, and the nation is fascinated and angry as, as well. Uh, Sean Bailey, your nominee. My nominee is Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, that's more like <laughs> For proving that it was all about her. In her speech, she used the words I or me 153 times and only mentioned Scotland 11 times. Yeah. It's, it, and why I picked her out is because she's been part of making a real division in this country. And if we're going to survive the recession, survive Brexit, survive everything, we need to come together. So move, removing this divisive politician, I think, was a great thing for the country. Now, that was so telling, actually, that the figures and the yeah. number of times she spoke about herself. Austin Sheridan, your nominee. Uh, my nominee is Keir Stammer um, for, for, um, for his double speak, for his complete incompetence and essentially a lack of leadership. Um, if he really wants people to believe that he's going to be a good Prime Minister, for goodness sake, he has to start telling us what his opinions are on things yeah. and start being honest about it. I couldn't agree more. Well done, Austin Sheridan, nominating tonight's union jackass Keir Stammer, because the problem is, right... Even if you agree, uh, which I think probably most folk do, that Jeremy Corbyn is not fit to be an MP, what happened to everything that Starmer said during his election campaign? What happened to the previous four years when he was in Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet, when he was campaigning 
for Corbyn to be prime minister when Starmer believed that Corbyn was not anti-Semitic. I, I, I honestly think we can't just forget about the lies that Starmer has told, given that this bloke might soon be in charge of us. Uh, Sarah Vine, Sean Bailey, Austin Sheridan, what a fabulous superstar panel. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for your company all week. It's been a dramatic one. Scheming Sturgeon is gone. What's going to happen next week? We'll find out when I'm back from 9pm on Monday night. Headline is up next, though. Good night. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance.